Hold on, let me put this towels away because, oh my God. <laughs> this reunion did not disappoint. It was lit. I love, love, love how Karen and Monique came to this reunion. They weren't playing with Giselle. I love seeing Giselle's little messy ass running her mouth, sweat. They got her ass all the way together. Did y'all see her unraveling? And Candace, bitch, I thought your ass was traumatized. You were pressed, okay? She was pressed trying to get Monique's attention. Little snide comments in the corner. And Monique, I love how she kept her composure. I'm thinking, Candace, if your ass was so traumatized, this girl put her hands on you. The, the amount of effort and energy that you put to get this lady to say just one word to you. Just one, girl. She did not pay you any mind. If you are so traumatized, why are you talking to your su su alleged abuser? Wendy needs to just not, she needs to be recasted. Find another Nigerian. Hell, pick me, <laughs> child, okay? I'll do the better job because Wendy gets to my damn nerves. But this reunion, I love. I'm about to get into it. I have my notes here because it was good. And y'all know when you see the notes, I'm about to talk. Before I do, go ahead and check out Amazon for my books. Just Add Pepper by A.S. Blaine. It's my first um, fiction novel, romance, drama, better than, the, you know, housewives drama. You love it. It keeps you on your toes. The second book to it is called Sage by A.S. Blaine. First one, Just Add Pepper. Second one, Sage um, A.S. Blaine. Those of you who've read it, this is the second book. I'm currently working on the third. I'm going to have the third book out by the end of this year. Also, check out my nonfiction. It's based on historical facts. has pictures in it by Adia Batsayan called Unleashed. I've heard great things about this book. If all else fails, read this one. I did not have it professionally edited because I don't have that kind of money. I'm not bothered like that. But it still gets my point across to so go ahead and check it out. I've heard great things. Now, best outfits. I preferred Wendy's outfit because Wendy looks beautiful in yellow. I love her outfit. Monique's outfit was beautiful as well. And Karen's fashion to me, I've always liked her fashion. She got a little problem with that damn wig that she had earlier on in the first couple seasons. But since she got a wig line now, she got her wig on point now. But she was beautiful as always. Worst dress, I did not like Candace and that damn bow that she had in front of her. What's the bow for, girl? Are you about to pop out of the damn box? I did not like her outfit. Candace's hair was good, but I thought that she could do better because I think she's had better confessional looks than what she had at this damn reunion. Robin looked bland as hell. Her outfit was bland, no character like Marlo says her outfit with her her makeup was great but her hairstyle looked plain ain't nothing adventurous about it Robin just like I said butch is what she screams butch is who she is and when I see her when she opens her mouth in addition to the no no character no outfit black hair when she speaks it's like you either piggybacking off of somebody else or you just don't make no damn sense girl shut up and go fix your relationship with Juan then we got Giselle's outfit was good Giselle's a beautiful woman I will say that but every time I see her it just seems like she Based, like she just did whatever. It doesn't really seem like she puts as much effort into it. Wendy's hair, I already said it in my other review when I reviewed the trailer. I was not feeling the straight hair on her. I would have preferred that she got something curly, wavy, something, you know, like, you know, full. The makeup that they did on Wendy, I did not like that either. She has beautiful brown chocolate skin and they caked it on like her features. It's just like they packed it on. I don't like that. You know, I like to see natural looks. And it seems like everybody else, I could tell it was their, still their face. Wendy just seemed like she was, I don't know, so far her faces was glowing. The other, I did not like Wendy's makeup at all. And when she asked me to get it touched up, I did not, I should, she should just done something else. Because that did not work for me at all. Her outfit was bomb. Then you get to the face and the hair, it wasn't working for me. Then we got the introductions, right? They talk about Giselle's fashions. And then they also bring up Candace and her prop. Candace brought a prop. She had a fan and she said, oh, I'm just here to fan out the haters. We knew that was a dig at Monique. That was her first effort to try and get Monique into a verbal argument with her again. This girl does not, this is why I keep saying that I don't pity her. She cries in every episode. She's always whining about how horrible life is and how she's so traumatized and how things are so bad for her. But here she is sitting across the, the, the couch, which I say in the reunion, I want to see all of them together so I can assess them properly. I'm watching Candace again throw little digs at Monique because she wants a reaction out of Monique. It's like you want somebody to get up and pop your ass in your head again. Monique to say two words to that girl and she's still picking at it. That's her first thing. I'm here to fan out the haters. Girl, shut up. Then we got... Karen describing Giselle's style as a hot ass mess and I said it before earlier Giselle doesn't really make an effort when it comes to picking her clothes I think Giselle knows she's beautiful and then Wendy says that she has the pretty girl syndrome if she's pretty in the face she don't gotta worry about anything else I think that's bullshit you can still be pretty in the face and you can still try to at least dress better and fit the part Karen to me is absolutely beautiful and I like her fashion 
uh, Monique is absolutely beautiful and I like her fashion. Candace is absolutely beautiful and I like her fashion too. So it isn't, beauty has nothing to do with it. It's just a matter of effort. And I don't think that she feels, she feels herself so much. She don't need to do that. Then they ask, um, they ask, uh, Robin about Giselle's style. Robin, obviously, because Giselle and her have maintained a friendship for a long time. And she probably knows that Giselle, as much as Giselle's mouth runs, Giselle is highly sensitive. So she don't want to tell the truth and tell us that Giselle's fashion is a hot ass mess. And she probably don't even know how to design her damn house. And her house is still being built. And, you know, it's in the projects. It's like build a bear type thing, situation going on. And she, she just puts it in the form of, you know, Giselle wears, you know, what she likes, but it works for her. It doesn't work for me, but it works for her. I.e., it's a hot mess. Tell the truth. Then we got uh, Giselle saying that Karen is obsessed with her because Karen brought up her fashions as well, which is not true. If anything, the entire season, Giselle always had a comment about what Karen is doing. And I since learned later on in this episode that Giselle's business is non-existent. It, it, we went poof since COVID. But it makes sense now why she makes such a great effort in trying to figure out what's wrong with whatever Karen is doing with her business, whether it's her perfume la dame or whether it's her, you know, wig line or whatever Karen is doing. It's like Giselle tries to pick it apart to find what's wrong with it. And here I am thinking now I get why the why she does that. Giselle is extremely jealous about Karen and Karen's success. And when she feels like she can't hurt Karen and she can't say anything to her, then what she goes to is she goes to Karen's age, which I don't know why Giselle's ass is 50. She's not like she's 20 some years old. She's 50. OK, so it's not like you old. you're damn near close to it. And a few more years, you'll be, you know, considered a senior citizen. You're not that far off. But I feel like it's her way of thinking that she one ups Karen is by bringing up her age. She can't bring up nothing else. Karen got money. Karen's husband ain't cheating on her. Karen got her, her shit together. She got her kids. She got her businesses. She's got her life together. And now she's on the same show as you. You got a man that you're chasing after that I'm going to talk about later on. But let's not get to it. I'm not even going to touch that just yet. Because I have a lot to say about Jamal when we get to him. But Giselle has a lot of things to be jealous of when it comes to Karen. So, But she's convinced, trying to tell herself, Karen's obsessed with me. Girl, you're obsessed with her. Tell the truth. Then we got... They're asking, you know, who uh, Andy asked him, who do you think is the best dressed? She asked Monique. Monique says, I think Karen is the best dressed. He asked Candace, Candace, who do you think is the best dressed? Candace says, I think it's between me and Karen. And then Andy, being messy as shady, you know, messy as ever, turns to Monique and says, you know, I thought you might say, you know, put yourself in the mix. Monique says, I'm not that vain. Candace then jumps in and says, in public. And Monique does what I would do, ignore the heifer, because this heifer is supposed to be mentally traumatized, right? In the beginning of this episode, they went out, you know, while they were still doing the makeup, Andy had walked up to Candace, and Candace says, I don't know why Monique, um, you, you know, went to therapy. You know, that situation is, you know, it's, it's surprising to me. It's baffling to me. She went to therapy because your ass will leave her ass alone. She's trying to ignore you. Y'all had a court case. You lost your case now because the judge saw what I'm seeing now. The girl don't want to talk to you. Why are you? Why do you keep talking to her? I have a I have an ex friend that does the same thing to me when I'm in the same room with her. I don't want to talk to her. She told me she doesn't like me. Well, bitch, I don't like your ass either. We were friends up until I was 18 years old. We grew apart. My life went this way. Your life went this way. You don't have to like me. If you don't like me, then don't speak to me, right? You hate me so much, so you shouldn't want to hear me or talk to me or interact with me. But every time I'm around her, she always has something to say because she doesn't like me. It's, well, if you don't like me, don't talk to me. That's how I feel. Don't speak to me. You don't have to deal with me. You're dust to me. So keep you and your hateful ass opinion to yourself. You can go straight to hell. But Candace like she does, is baiting her. First example of that. Then we got Karen's Twitter posts uh, uh, about the Green Eye Bandits are brought up because Karen has since been doing a lot of posts after she's watching the show and seeing basically all the shit that Robin and Giselle were doing and saying. J Robin had her take a photo about her, her little uh, hat business and she deliberately kept Karen off of it because she was trying to be loyal to Giselle and they were talking about how her picture wasn't that appealing which was a dig it was a shady thing to do why would have her take a picture and not put it up there then when Ray comes up uh, uh Robin jumps up the wagon like you you know you afraid of what you say when you're drunk about you know you don't like him having sex with Ray or Ray has Ray's penis is dried they always find something to say it to Karen and Karen has had enough. So now she's on Twitter after she's seen the comments they've been making and she's going off, okay, on both these heifers. And Monique and her did not come to play with these girls in this reunion. We are face to face. Your ass is not behind in the confessionals and the green screen. You're in my face now, Karen says. And if you want to say something to me, let me know so I can tear you apart to your face 
not behind closed doors or when I'm not watching, but that's what that was. Then Robin tries to say, you know, people try to blame us for the fight between Candace and Monique and their actions. I was getting death threats in my DM. Girl, shut up. Shut up. Anybody threaten you? They probably don't even remember your name. Robin, okay? They probably don't remember your name. I had watched this five seasons and it wasn't until I think the second or third season that I, I basically remembered your name before I'd be like, um, um, I have to think about it. Anybody saying you nothing, girl? They probably sent me somebody else named Robin, some death threats child. Stop. Then they bring up Wendy's nonstop reminded degrees. And Wendy says, you know, as the first Nigerian housewife, it is in our culture, education is a huge thing. And because of that, she has to be true to herself. Is Wendy lying? No. I just finished my master's and my dad was like, okay, go get your PhD. And I was supposed to be applying for my PhD by January 5th and hopefully God I get it. If I don't get it, I'm going to take it as a sign. I'm not supposed to do it because that's a five-year stretch, okay? However, I understand where Wendy's coming from with the education. But the way that Wendy puts it into people's face is very off-putting. Now, Ashley made, made a point when she said that she's very proud of Wendy, yes, because Wendy says Nigerian people are very proud. However, the way that she uses it to put down people, and she did use it to put down Ashley when she said, that's Dr. Wendy to you, that is a guaranteed fact. When Wendy approaches it that way, it makes it hard for other people to look at her accolades as something commendable because you're using it to put people down. I've had somebody look at me in my face telling me, oh, because you think you have degrees, you think you're better than people. The irony of the situation between myself and Wendy is that I had never actually mentioned my degrees to that person that person was just feeling some type of way and feeling inadequate and they're trying to project the insecurities on me but never once am i going to have a conversation with somebody and say well because i have this degree I, you know you should refer to me as this if somebody asks me about it i'm going to offer that information because i have earned it it's my hard work that shit ain't easy to get okay but i'm not going to use it as like i have the degrees i have four degrees i have four degrees I'm, no girl we don't like no let somebody get to know you and let people congratulate you about that it's hard to get but damn girl i mean seriously then they bring up trigger words and how ashley uses uh certain words to uh certain words that are racially specific ashley is a fair is a light-skinned girl i don't know if ashley i think ashley's a little bit black but someone in her family is white because of her complexion and she uses words like divisive and aggressive and certain trigger words that she uses when she's illustrating interactions that she had with monique and not with monique with candace and with wendy in this season right and she uses those words and they're trying to basically say that i'm gonna get to that in a minute but that was brought up the next topic they talk about is karen and wendy's relationship with each other because karen did not like wendy from the moment she got on the show we soon find out that when i guess karen tried to get wendy booted off the show because she wasn't part of potomac i don't think that's the reason wendy to me is not likable the way that she behaves the way that she carries herself sometimes it makes her not likable. And the fact that she had so much to say about Monique when she has not been privy to what's happened in the last few seasons and try to make it her own storyline, that was something that irked my spirit when talking about when Wendy spoke. Wendy, to me, is highly smart, highly educated, highly accomplished. But outside of that, the way that she maneuvered herself this entire season, I don't know if she felt inadequate and she felt like she wanted to be just on par with them and she felt like she had to do those things. Perhaps that was her motivation, but compared to some of the uh, some of the housewives, if I was to say people that I want not to come back, I would say Robin and Wendy can go. You can keep Ashley, you can keep Monique, keep Candace, keep Karen, keep Giselle's messy ass, but bring two other people in here so we can help bring back Sharice's ass so we can see why, how she fits into all this drama. But Wendy, to me, I can do without. That's just me. Now, they bring up how Giselle added the additional word floozy to be messy and shady and try to get a reaction out of Wendy because Giselle, did, I told you and I said it again, Giselle is very jealous of Karen. Floozy is not something small and funny, ha ha ha, to add when you're trying to elaborate that somebody was talking shit. If you're trying to look at Wendy and say, Wendy, you know, before you came over here, Karen had a lot to say about you, then you can tell her Karen had a lot to say about you, but you kept adding a little bit extra fluff to it so you can get the reaction you wanted from Karen because you thought that Wendy was going to rip Karen apart. But Karen stands her ground. So Giselle, you got pie in your face again. That's what that was. Because Andy looked at her and said floozy is a huge word to add. Because Karen didn't say that. Because she didn't say that. Now we got Candace and her relationship with her husband and her Twitter behavior are brought up to the you know conversation. Candace uh, in her Twitter called Ashley a roach. 
She called her trash and she called her a wench. And then when they talk to Candace, everybody is saying, Candace, you know, when you go on Twitter, your words are lethal. Your words are weapons. These are things that somebody can use as bullying. You're calling somebody a roach, uh oh, trash, and uh, on Twitter, and you're calling them a wench. When you yourself, if somebody calls you something, you're going to go in the corner and cry. You have cried more than any housewife. Hell, even more than Candy from Real Houses of Atlanta. Your ass cried too damn much. But when it comes to your mouth, you want to go ahead and run it. She calls somebody a wench, a roach, when that person had just got out of a miscarriage. Talking about her. And when she had her baby, she still talked about her. That's mental abuse and that's emotional abuse. But she, now Andy's telling her, yo, you do too much and she's minimizing it. Now, is Ashley a victim? Hell no. Excuse me. Hell no. I don't feel sorry for Ashley either. Because Ashley herself also has said very hurtful things to Robin about her relationship. Even though I didn't agree with it, but that was the truth. Ro uh, Ashley does have a way with words. The first season that Ashley came, uh, first season of Real Housewives of Potomac, Ashley, the entire first season was annoying as fuck. She had a lot to say to, about everybody's situation. And she, I felt like she was doing it because that was her way of securing the bag. Michael and her had signed a prenup. And the prenup said that she wasn't going to get no damn money unless she had a baby or unless their marriage got to a certain point. Y'all remember she was trying to start that restaurant because she wanted to have some money of her own, put something in a relationship because she don't want to go back to being poor. And so this money, people get paid for being on this reality show. She's getting paid for it. And that's the money that she wanted to use for herself and for her family. So she was willing to say and do whatever is necessary to cause enough drama as a reality TV to get her ass kept on the show. Ashley knows exactly what she's doing. She is very calculating. So from that behavior, I cannot sit here and look at her as a victim. I can't. But is she right that Candace talks too damn much and says some stuff that's horrible to people? Yes, that's true too. But Ashley, so do you. It's like a, it's like a, a two sides of a coin. I don't feel bad for Candace and I damn sure don't feel bad for Ashley at all. Now we got... Candace, in the midst of the argument, bringing up Michael, and she says, Michael is itching, get tested. This is the problem I have with Candace. Whenever Candace is having an argument, the argument is between you and I. She will bring up your, your, your dead grandma, your dead grandfather, your baby that's not even been born yet. She'll bring up your husband in a conversation when her husband wasn't part of it. She'll just bring it up just to throw something in your face. And this is the issue that Karen herself has with her. You talk too much. When you fight, you go way below the belt when it didn't have to be that way. Just because you don't like what the person is saying to you. She did it at the table, I think at the, at the dinner table when they were still in Portugal. And Ashley was trying to talk to her. She brought up Michael again because she knows that's a sore spot. For Ashley, that is somebody's husband. And you know, Candace will go up here and rah rah if somebody says something about Chris. Because that's her husband. It's the same thing I would do if somebody talks about my husband in front of my face. You better be prepared to square up. Because you're not going to like what comes out of my mouth. If you and I have an argument, keep me and mine, my husband, my children, out of the conversations between you and I. The only reason you're going to bring up my husband is if your ass is losing and you feel like I'm saying something to you that is right or that you can't take, that you want to throw something else to throw me off. That's the only reason you're going to do because you're a punk. That's, what, that's how I see it. But then... Ashley, uh, Ashley decides to say, don't talk about my kids, talk about my husband. Robin's ass jumps in the conversation when it got nothing to do with her. Robin wants a moment. She wants a moment. So she jumps in and says, Ashley, why are you getting mad when you did the same thing about, uh, we did the same thing to me and talked about my husband and my, Robin, you already addressed this with, 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 with Ashley. Oh, wow. She's already addressed this before the same issue. Why are you bringing this up now except to try to be relevant in the situation that didn't have nothing to do with you? Ashley and Candace are arguing. You're not important. We don't have anything to talk about this entire reunion, three parts with Robin except her engagement. That's it. Ain't nothing else to talk about. So the only thing that she could do now is insert herself in other people's drama. She opens her mouth and she says, Ashley, why are you saying this? You already said this before. Let it go. We've heard this a thousand times. We don't want to hear it no more. Yes, Ashley talked about your family. That was season one. Y'all have dealt with it. We're in season five. If you ain't got nothing to say, shut up and sit in your corner and be quiet. Then she says something like, well, Candace didn't say anything rude about your family. She just said that Dean looked like Michael. Uh, you know, is that rude? We all know that Candace doesn't like Michael. So if she says Dean looks like Michael, is supposed to be a dick. The boy does look like Michael. Hell, he looks like he's Michael in his 50s right now. <laughs> Dean don't look like a damn baby. He looks like he's grown, like fully grown. His face looks like a grown ass man. But the way that Candace said it wasn't, com wasn't complimentary. So I can see how Ashley's going to take an insult to it. Because she said, wasn't that rude? <laughs> Maybe Ashley don't want Dean to look like Michael. Who knows? Child, I don't know. But in, in fairness... 
Ashley did interrupt Candace's conversation with Andy because they were asking Candace about the song that she remixed from her wedding. And Ashley had taken a dig at her saying, you put some beats on yodeling, it sounds good. And then Candace says, which your, your, your voice is trash. So that's how the fight began because Ashley inserted herself in that conversation. But still, that argument was between Candace and Ashley. Robin should have just, you know, it had nothing to do with her. She needs to just sit down there and be bland and boring like she normally is. Then we got the colorism topic comes up, which I was going to address before. I'm going to address it now about the word aggressive on social media. Monique says that it's about judging the behavior at the moment. That's why they use the word aggressive. And then Ashley's choice of words using buzzwords are brought into question. She uses words like aggressive and ferocious. Ashley's using those words because she's married to a white man. And that's probably the words that he uses when he he, he drops certain information towards in her, in her head. And that's where she goes and she projects. Ashley is married to a man who doesn't understand our culture, doesn't understand what we have had to go through as black people. So, of course, Ashley would naturally react in the way that she that's where her spirit is. She uses the word aggressive and ferocious. And yes, there are situations where aggression is the right term, but she uses it consistently. And there are other words that she uses that are almost like the angry black woman type stereotype. And then Andy asked a very, very important question. Well, if you cannot use aggressive or ferocious as certain trigger words to elaborate your, you know, what you're trying to say, because Ashley's in the corner going, it's the English language, it's the English language. The English language is also being used to insult African Americans in multiple ways. The N-I-G-G-E-R is in the English language and it's also in the dictionary with a description, it's, it's also a word. There are C-O-O-N is also in the dictionary. There are several English language words. It, that's That makes no sense, girl. You're using trigger words and you're using it against people who are of a darker hue. And it paints a certain picture on social media of the stereotype of an angry black woman, okay? I've had conversations with people. And one of the conversations I had was with a law enforcement officer. He was Hispanic, I think. And he stopped me at a routine traffic stop. I was speeding. I didn't know. You know, it was one of those, day, one of those days I had my mind elsewhere. And he pulled me over. And I wasn't really following the rules because I forgot to park. It was early morning. I just wasn't there that day. I was too tired. I wasn't thinking straight. Now, I was following every single rule he told me to. Put your hands, you know, park the car, park the car. Put your hands on the wheel, put your hands on the wheel. He sat there and he was aggressively just screaming at the top of his lungs. It's just me in the car. My hands are on the wheel. And I got this cop who got a gun, a baton, a pepper spray. And he's screaming at me in the street, you know, just screaming at me as if I just committed, you know, some kind of murder or something. Now, in a different environment, if somebody approached me in that way, had it been somebody else, to me, I thought that it was just, you're ready to square up, let's fight right but because of his his his, his him being a, a cop i had to react to him a different way but i did report him to his, you know to whatever and so we had to sit in this room and we had to interact with each other right we had to, and i had to, i'm like i just want to explain to him i came there like i just want to explain to him like listen you're a cop i'm a civilian i understand that you have seen crazy things and you might be frustrated but this was a routine traffic stop i was speedy you're supposed to give me a ticket for whatever, I had my license, I had my registration, and keep me going. I wasn't hurting anybody. This is not a shooting. It was early morning. It was like 7 in the morning. When you approach somebody that way, you're going to be the reason why the situation escalates. And you're the one with the gun. If something bad happens, what you going to say? This man had the nerve to say, well, I was scared for my life. Those are trigger words that you're using because I'm black. You understand what I'm saying? Those are things that you're using because I'm sitting across from you. You're Hispanic. I'm black. And you have you think this is a joke. And then I got we had this mediator sitting in the room and it was a Hispanic person because, of course, they were trying to be racially, I guess, fair. They had a Hispanic person and they had a black person. They had a Hispanic sitting next to me. They had a black sitting next to him. And they're supposed to mediate a conversation. I brought my father with me and they're telling me, oh, can you understand that he was frustrated? I said, and then the, the Hispanic lady tried to minimize the saying, so you're here because he yelled at you? I said, listen to me very carefully because I'm, you need to understand something. I have parents. I'm a Nigerian woman. We get yelled at. That's like a, like a normal voice for us is that we get yelled at. That's not the issue. The issue is I have someone who is deliberately antagonizing me in a situation that is already, in, you know, it's already not working well. You're a cop. I'm a civilian. You're not supposed to instill fear in your own citizens, especially when I'm not committing a crime while I'm hurting somebody. I was speeding. You're here to give me a ticket. But when you're using trigger words like, oh, she, you know, I'm scared for my life and this is and this, 
You're trying to portray something that is very stereotypical and you sitting here minimizing it. What would have happened if I was somebody else that was raised differently and I chose to match his aggression, match his behavior? Because between the two of us, he was the one being aggressive and yet he's the one that's sitting here saying he's scared for his life. If I would have fought him, one of us would end up dead or both of us. Then what would you have said? Oh, it's because he was frustrated. There are certain things that are, are done specifically and are directed to a particular race based on what stereotypes are projected out there. Ashley is very familiar with it, but because of who she's married to and because of the environment that she's in, she's now using it as a way to attack another person. I've seen her do it multiple times throughout the season, but I'm glad that somebody called her out and told her to watch her mouth. Do I think that people can be aggressive sometimes? Yes, I do. But you need to be careful not to put that label as an angry black woman because the person is very, very outspoken. <laughs> When your ass is just, your ass is yelling and screaming at Candace too. Should we call you aggressive? It's a double standard. It is. Then we got, um, Robin then says, words have weight. <laughs> Robin, baby, shut up. When everybody's sitting here after the Candace and Monique fight, and we're saying that Candace's words were weaponized. Candace's, Candace's behavior is out of control. The things that comes out of her mouth and she thinks that they're minim minimal things are not minimal. There's some people in this world you talk to that way and they'll just beat your ass. When we were saying that, Robin, you said that, say, something like, well, physical violence is never acceptable, da, 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 da. But here you are backtracking saying words have weight. So which is it? Because now you're confusing the hell out of me. It just basically tells me your ass don't like Monique because Giselle don't like Monique. And so far as Giselle sides with Candace, you're going to float that boat. That's what you are. You're somebody who's following Giselle's footsteps because what you're saying right now is, is contradicting yourselves. Are you? Because if that's the case, words have weights, then you should be able to hold Candace accountable for her words. This is why I said both Candace and Monique are at fault. Instead of people just saying Candace is the victim here. Somebody who's this damn traumatized will not be sitting here doing what she's doing right now. Child, I'm not buying that bull. Knock it off. The case is over, so that's why she's acting the way she's acting. That's what it is. Then we got um, a five-minute break. During the five-minute break, Wendy was asking for her makeup to be touched up. I'm like, girl, how much more makeup could they put on your face? You look like a damn clown at that point. Then we got Wendy bringing up the fact that Candace is yet to take responsibility for any of the stuff that she says because she hasn't. Andy made an effort to call her out saying that she does say some crazy stuff online and she just said thank you. I mean, she didn't really take responsibility for nothing. Then she said that she got her receipts and she's about to let him go and I can't wait to get into them because we get to the next topic, Jamal and Giselle's relationship. I said Giselle's being punked. If she thinks that this fake ass situation passes as a relationship. Somebody in my comments said that Giselle is not really in a relationship with Jamal. And Karen later on said that Jamal basically is telling everybody that this is just reality TV. He's not really with her. And it makes sense because I told y'all that he had missed every single opportunity that he can come and show off and show off as his as, as he's with her. He's missed it. He missed the photo shoot. He missed the uh, Robin's party, the Christmas party that he was supposed to be there. He missed that. Those would have been two events that he could show up and say that he's with her and be with her. He only shows up in the scenes where his children are there when they're eating dinner. The photo shoot, the photo shoot was supposed to be a family shoot. He missed it. When it's just him eating, eating with his kids, whatever the case is, he's looking at it like a natural thing that we do. They're sitting apart. They're not kissing. They're not holding hands. And you can always go back to his girlfriends, and I say plural girlfriends, and spin it. Robin, uh, not Robin, Giselle, oh, Giselle, poor Giselle, as beautiful as you are, you're one of those people. Because Jamal to me is not cute. And Giselle is very beautiful. And I feel like J Jamal does a lot to her character and her self-esteem. She doesn't really understand what she, how much she's worth. And she thinks that she could just, I'm going to get to her. I'm going to keep talking about her, but let's keep going. Now, they bring up Giselle's dreadful theme of a design for her house. Karen's talking to her about her house and how dreadful her house is. And, you know, she brings up Karen's age again, telling her her geritol, is, her geritol just kicked in as if her ass ain't 50. Like I said, whenever she's mad and Karen, she doesn't have anything else to say to Karen, she'll bring up her age. And then they ask Giselle about her business, right? Giselle says that her business is shut down because the manufacturer got uh, closed down due to COVID. And then Karen's like, so you talk about my business is not existing, but yours over here being shut down. And of course, Giselle ain't got nothing to say to her. Her rebuttals are horrible. She's caught up and she's sitting up there sweating because Karen did not come to play with her at this reunion. Karen has had enough 
of Giselle's behavior for the past three seasons, and I'm all here for it, Karen. Get ass. Then Karen says, word on the street about Jamal and Giselle's fake relationship is that Jamal is just with her to save her job. Giselle doesn't have anything important to, to add to the show, so Jamal decided to be her relationship Kind of like what Kenya did with the guy uh, initially, was it Walter? When it came to uh, Real Housewives of Atlanta, she did the same thing is what they're saying. That Jamal is just there as a pretend relationship that she could use to keep herself in the show. She can keep making money. That it's not really real. Andy asks her, is your relationship with Jamal really real? She says, she says yes. But then Karen says, he just had a seventh baby from a woman around the same time that he's supposedly in a relationship with you. And your father even said that. Giselle says, oh, my father's exaggerating. It's not really true. He didn't have a baby. I don't believe it. <clears throat> Andy asked her, Giselle, would you stay with Jamal if you found out that this was true? Giselle says, it's not true. Y'all notice that she didn't say I won't? She said, it's not true. Here's the thing. Do I think that Giselle will stay with Jamal even if he was still cheating on her? Yes, I believe it from the bottom of my heart. I feel like... I've said in my last reviews that I was in a relationship where it was a situation ship and I was in it for a while. I had met somebody when I was like, what, 13, 14? At the time, I thought I was a lesbian because I hadn't yet developed an attraction to the opposite sex. But I saw a lot of beautiful people, beautiful women. The one time I found an attraction to this one guy, that was my first person I ever loved and I ever felt whatever love was supposed to be like, I felt it with him. And for a long time, that was my first in love, my first experience. It was a situation ship, but I, I did not, I gave too much because it was my first experience. And I think that as time went by, because of how much love I poured into this individual and how much abuse he poured and I just took it like I was just being toyed around with, my heart was playing around with, I didn't understand my worth. I'm a beautiful woman. I know I'm a beautiful woman, but a lot of the girls that he would date aren't dark skin. He dated white women, Indian women, Mexican women, mixed chicks women when it comes to black women he usually fell for the lighter mixed ones he never really I, I never at some point saw him with a dark complected woman and then his own family would say things like yeah but she's different as in i'm different and because i guess out of all the black the dark skinned people i was the one that fell out the part that oh i'm i'm pretty enough or or decent enough to have to have caught his eye because normally he wouldn't date somebody like me and so for a while there was a time when I thought there was something wrong with me. But I learned over time that it wasn't just that. He also grew to feel like he could go be with someone else for however long it takes for that spark and that honeymoon phase to go. But he always thought in the back of his mind, no matter what happens, I would always be there as a backup plan. So if this don't work out, whenever it don't work out, he'll come back and tell me he missed me. And I think this kind of this cycle kind of went kept up to I think I was about 22, 23 years old. Um, before I figured I deserve better than this. This is just not, I'm not even doing this. It, it took me time to break out of it. Giselle has a long history with Jamal. Very beautiful. You know, she has a smart mouth with everybody else. She has a strong strength with everybody else. But when it comes to Jamal, she turns into this mush, this weak person that's not able to see what's right in front of her. And I feel like Jamal knows this about her. He can go and be with whoever he wants to be with, sleep with half the congregation and then some. Uh, Pastor Holy Whore is what Monique called him. He can go in here and sling his dick all over Atlanta, all over Maryland. Whatever he wants to do, he can go out here and just spread it wide and just giving his seed out for free to everybody and everybody who will spread their legs for him. And when he gets old and the Viagra stops working, he can always know in the back of his head, Giselle will always be there because she has been there this entire time that I have treated her like crap. I've cheated on her, had all these babies on her. She got three kids of mine that she's taking care of. Of. she's dated all these people because there was a scene that Giselle was talking to Jamal and he put it as in like who else would you be with and she's like are you saying that if I can't be with you I can't be with anybody else I can't he's like well you can't follow that with anybody else he knows in his spirit that he has that woman hooked I don't know what it is about him but he knows he has her hooked because in this episode Monique had a lot of fucking receipts and you have to be stupid to ignore them period but we keep going Monique then says um, that she brought up the girlfriend that Jamal is currently with who, uh, who basically admitted to her that Jamal said it was reality TV and he's not with Giselle. Candace is again, this is nothing to do with her. 
Wendy's, Monique's not talking to her. Monique's ignoring her. She's like, she's been waiting to drop this receipt for a while. She is begging for Monique's attention. Y'all see this bait I'm talking about? Keep baiting her, bitch. Then we got, there's, she bought her receipt book. And then Robert turns to Monique and says, what's your motivation? Because she wants to now spare Giselle's feelings. And I love, love how Monique ignored Robin's ass and ignored Candace's ass. Y'all don't have nothing to say about this. I'm not talking to you. I'm not addressing you. You don't speak to me. Robin, you had a lot to say about me. You played me, act the food in the, in the freaking confessional, acted like you were cool. I invited you to sit. You didn't say nothing. So fuck you, bitch. You can just sit over here and mind your business. Don't talk to me. You don't like me. Don't speak to me. Don't breathe me. Don't breathe my air. Stay over there. Mind your business. Giselle's going to take all this verbal ass whooping. She's going to swallow it. She had a lot to say about me and my man and my babies and a lot to say about what's going on try to kick me off the show saying that she don't want to be around me bitch you need to not be around Jamal and his crazy ass but she brought it up and she said that she not only received receipts from the girl saying that Jamal said it was just reality tv that they're not together but Jamal was sending her pictures while he was on tour and Andy said how'd you know that that's his number she said well I can read you the number I'm sure that Giselle will know what num what Jamal who's what Jamal's number is she read the, that number out loud. And guess what? Giselle, and he was like, Giselle, is that his number? Giselle says, yes, that's his number. Bitch, I hollered, hollered. Because girl, you cannot deny these receipts. These are current text messages. These are his number by way you just admitted. You know what Giselle says? I don't believe anything that Monique says. Even Candace is looking at her like, that's unfortunate. That's what she said because she knows he's telling the truth. Monique may have been messy in this situation where she was hella messy and she brought her receipts to prove that she was going to be messy but tell the truth is going to be proof. You're not about to call me a liar here. However, we're not going to act like what's coming out of her mouth is a damn lie. I believe every last word of what Monique said and every last receipt that she brought because she read that number. She didn't make that number up. And Giselle admitted that, that was his number child. Monique is telling the truth. What you want, what you don't want to do is admit that you have now given a man a chance who you left for cheating on you. And he's doing the same thing that he did to you again. And your daughters were right when they don't want you to be with him. He has not changed. You got to understand these daughters have been around their dad without Giselle. They've gone to visit him. They spent probably weekends with him. They've seen all the different girls that crawl up and down his house. They know their father is a hoe. A pastor of a hoe, the holy whore, the holy whore of a prophet. That's what he is, a false prophet over here in the congregation preaching to people and then slinging his penis up inside him when he can. He is false to everything. But Giselle, Giselle is sprung. She sprung. And I feel for her. At 50 years old, it took me till I was 23 to break free from that nonsense because I felt like I deserve better. I knew I deserve better. And now I have better. Okay, and my husband now is sexier and finer than that person I thought was the most beautiful thing on earth the first time I saw him when I was 13 years old and had the first crush on him. I have met better. And you know what's ironic about it? He is fine, buff, smart. Oh my God, he is beautiful. I love that man to death. I just, ugh, I can't stop looking at him. And it's ironic because all my friends will look at him and start drooling over my husband. My husband is a gorgeous man. He is. I'm not going to, he is. And of course he is. Look at me. But back then he made me feel like I was less than and he was dating all these different people. Jamal, somehow there's something he's saying to Giselle to make her feel like it's a blessing for her to be with him. He's a pastor. She said, you can call me first lady. She wants that title. She herself probably wants to dip into the church funds too. And Jamal knows this. So Jamal is going to live in Atlanta, move to, you know, go back and forth to Maryland, have different women in different areas, and then go back to Potomac and tell Giselle they're together. That's what he's going to keep doing. Because Giselle, oh my gosh, it looked like she was going to break down. I was surprised she didn't cry. And Candace, of course, wants attention. So she's screaming the whole time. How y'all, Monique brought all these receipts and y'all just sitting here, y'all going to let her do this? Karen, that's your friend. That's your friend. But Karen's messy ass turns to Giselle and says, Giselle, is Jamal coming? <laughs> Giselle said, no. Karen responded, of course not. Even Andy's jaw was dropped. Because we know, and they know damn well, that was the truth. Giselle just looks so stupid. Monique and Kara was not giving Giselle any room to do what she always does. 
be the bully on the stage and think she got it all. And Candace, you keep trying it. If Monique get up and bust your ass again, you will start crying and doing all these post-it notes and taking all these pills and telling yourself that you just need to kill your, your anxiety, you have your mental state, you need to see a therapist, a psychiatrist, you know, a, a, a exorcist, somebody, a voodoo doctor. You're going to be doing everything and anything to try to get yourself all the way together. But here you are screening. Are we listening to this? Shut the fuck up. Ain't nobody talking to you. Let Giselle handle this. Yeah, it had nothing to do with you. Robin and Candace, shut up. Because Ashley's sitting up here. Wendy, for the first time, shut her mouth because she knows it's true this reunion gave me life i cannot wait till part two i can't wait till monique's husband joins the cast i can't wait till michael joins the cast i want to hear what everybody has to say i won't want to explain to us why he and michael are going to go to this bachelorette party by themselves they have a special relationship i want to know what that relationship is child <laughs> i enjoy this reunion please like subscribe and notification bell let me know what you think about this reunion tell me your opinion about what's going on and what you think about monique and everything that she did because i was very much proud of her i was proud that she got giselle together because giselle has deserved it this girl earned it she needed it okay she needed to be humbled just a little bit okay bye